Where did you, did you serve? In Vietnam. And, and what was your branch of service? Army. And your highest rank? Staff Sergeant. And in what general location did you serve? Kind of go chronologically, starting with basic training and then moving through your... Uh, Fort Knox, Kentucky for basic training. For advanced individual training, I went to Fort Sam Houston. And from there was flown to Vietnam and spent the majority of my time uh, in two corps. And to be perfectly honest, we also spent a great deal of time on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, where they said we never were. Um, well, tell me what, where were you living at the time that you enlisted? You did enlist, you were drafted. Correct. And can you tell me about what, why did you decide to enlist at that time? It's in 1968, Vietnam yeah, was going on. I know, and there was a lot of, uh, there were many people who were very much against the war, and uh, I would have to say the main thing was that I just felt that uh, it was the right thing for me to do at that time. And to be perfectly honest with you, I can't exactly remember anything specific above and beyond that that motivated me. Um, but I will say that it was a tremendous shock once I, went, I got over there and realized what I had gotten myself into. Uh, it was uh, very surrealistic at first. Um, going from an environment such as northeastern Connecticut where the weather was what it was and going to Vietnam where when you stepped off the plane it was 125 degrees with humidity to match and uh, within the first two weeks you lose approximately 15% of your body weight your blood thins down by 15% and if you have any problems with asthma you're in a lot of trouble <clears throat> what did your family think of you joining your parents? My mother was very concerned. Um, we, we corresponded weekly. I, I wrote her every single week, at least two or three times a week, just to reassure her that I was alive. And uh, she kept all those letters. And um, I sent things to her when I could. In fact, when I went on R&R &R to Bangkok, I sent her uh, some Thai silk, which she kept until I came back. Um, and um, it, was, uh, it was a very, very strenuous time for her because the news media was continually talking about raids and people being killed and this, that, and the other thing. So I'm sure it was a lot more stressful for her in the long run than it was for me, although we had our day-to-day -day stress as well while we were out there in the field. Uh, I spent the majority, I would say, I spent a good 85% of my tour duty in Vietnam out in the field. Um, so just one more question on before you. Why did you pick the Army? Do you remember it? Over the Marines, the Navy, the uh, I had a few friends who were in. And uh, I really didn't like the Marines that much. Um, and I can't say why, other than although when I was in Vietnam, we had experiences with the Marines would stay centrally located in a specific spot, and they would get hit by the enemy continually and primarily because they didn't move around enough, whereas we were continually on the move. We never stayed in the same spot for maybe two, three weeks at the very most. And then we, we completely destroyed the camp that we had built, and we'd move on to another location and build another one. Um, I just thought it was a better fit for me, and um, as it turned out, it was an incredible experience. We uh, our doctor that went with us throughout the majority of my tour out in the field was named Dr. Dulo. And, uh, and he was just as amazing as his name. We had some experiences out in the field that uh, 
defined description, to say the least. Um, your basic training, anything stand out with your basic training? Any surprises? <laughs> How yeah, did you deal with yes. basic training? Uh, Basic training was, it was brutal. Georgia was absolutely torrid as far as the heat and the humidity. Um, the thing that stood out the most was the two-week bivouac at the end of basic training. Myself and four other, four other people were sent out there three days in advance. We set up in the camp. Uh, the first night there, three cougars came to the tent and they were absolutely exhausted. They were looking for water. There was no water around because there was so much heat. So we went out, you know, scared to death because they were, they were three cougars out there. And we started up the hoses. As soon as we did that, they came over and drank right out of our hands. It was amazing. That was the first night. The third night before the rest of the company came, I woke up in the morning, stepped out of my cot that I was in, and stepped right on top of a six-foot diamondback rattlesnake. He went through one side of the tent, and I went through the other. <laughs> and then we tried to run him over with one of the four-by-fours that we had out there. And we ran him over, God knows, 30 or 40 times. He just kept right on going, didn't even phase him at the least. And um, I had to change my clothes and my underwear. It was, it was, it was not the best two or three days I've ever had in my life. But an experience, nevertheless. So from basic training, you went to your AIT? Fort Sam Houston. And was you trained to be a? Combat medic. And um, the training was, was very, very good. Very, very thorough. Um, and the atmosphere in Sam Houston was incredible. It was, what a difference from Fort Fort Knox. Woo! It was just, you know, you go downtown and there was a, a million different things to do, see, places to go. And uh, it was it was it was a very, very happy point in say from the beginning of service until the point before I went to Vietnam. It was a good way to go over. It was a shock when I got off the plane. So uh, you, you felt ready though once you got through your AI. Yes, you I did. Training. Yeah, very you much so. Yeah, yeah. And um, mentally and physically, I felt that way. Um, a lot of people didn't, um, and I'm not sure why they were insecure about that. I was I was 24 at the time I went in, so I was a little older than the majority. Majority were 18, 19 years old. Um, and you wouldn't think that short amount of time would make a big difference, but it seemed to. Um, so, from your AIT, you went to Vietnam from there? Correct. You went there with the youth, with, as a part of a whole unit, or did you just go in and Not everybody life? went. Some people went in different directions, but a large number of us went together. Um, although once we got there, uh, people were broken up again and headed in different directions to different groups. And uh, I remember one guy saying, I'm not supposed to be here. I'm supposed to be in, in Germany at a nice hospital. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, well, you know, it doesn't always work out the way you want it to. And um, I knew where I was headed from the beginning. and. Uh, you know, I wasn't surprised in the least. Um, I was surprised at the intensity of the humidity and the heat and the fact that I was carrying 65 pounds on my back and the fact that in the first two weeks we just, you know, it was brutal, absolutely brutal. We were out in the jungle immediately. And um, the first two weeks, many of the people there thought, you know, I'm not going to make it. <laughs> that was the general consensus because of the uh, severe strain on your body, physically and chemically, internally. Um, you really, uh, 
you really had to make some serious adjustments. Plus, going through triple canopy jungle and water up to your waist and mud, you know, it was uh, anything but wonderful. What was your arrival like there? Anything? We were shot at when we landed. You find the shot as you landed? Yes. Yeah. A AK, yeah, welcome to Vietnam, AK-47s. They riddled the back end of the plane. We had to skid on the runway. Really? Yeah. Have you had second thoughts at that point? Uh, no, I was just very glad to be on the ground and in one piece. Yeah. You know, you, when you're in a situation like that where it's something completely new, you don't really know what to expect and you don't anticipate and you don't, you react initially with shock, but at the same time, you're just, you're really glad that you're alive and in one piece, and, you know, on the ground again. So, I don't think, I don't think anybody was terribly upset once we were down on the ground, <laughs> so to speak. So, were you your first unit? The unit you were assigned to in Vietnam, what unit was that? Echo Company, 1st to the 8th, 1st Air Cavalry. And, and uh, tell me a little bit about, I know you said you went out and spent a couple months out in the jungle right off the bat. What was their mission? What were, what were some of the things? Search and there? destroy, okay. primarily. And uh, we operated primarily at night, set up um, ambush sites along rivers, along uh, possible areas where the enemy would be coming through, and um, and many many times they knew that we that we were there ahead of that. And they would attack us at night, so um, it was a situation where after a while you became very used to having tracer rounds going over your head, um, having a ballistics blowing up around you. Um, out of the majority of the enemy that we faced, for every 10 of them, only one of them had a rifle and the rest had explosives. It was, um, they were very, very undersupplied as far as, which was to our benefit for sure. And, um, but they were also extremely well trained. We had, we had two um, mountain yards, which are the equivalent of the Vietnamese Negro. And um, they showed us how they were trained to go through concertina wire when they were attacking our perimeters. And they would have, they would have rubber bands on both arms and as they went by, would, they would take one, squeeze it down, and put it over a hand grenade so that the clip wouldn't engage when you went by it and tripped it. You know, things like that. And uh, they were extremely well trained, considering. And their motivation was incredible. They gave each of them P-38 can openers and told them, as soon as you kill all the GIs and the Americans, you can have all their sea rations and eat all you want. And that was enough motivation for them to go forward with no weapon, just explosives, sometimes not even working, and try to come through our wires and breach our perimeter and kill us. What was their when you say explosives, you sound like grenades or... Primarily, yeah. C4? Or, or pipe bombs, C4, yeah. And and a lot of them didn't even work. They were not... They were not well armed. If they had been, in many cases, I think we would have got our butt cut. So, during... During these battles, you as a combat medic, what, what was your job? You had your own the majority of the majority of the times that we came in contact, which was frequently, um, we would sustain injuries within the first thirty to forty-five seconds 
almost always. So as per, per se, in any given evening when this happened, um, I would be working on people within two to three minutes after we were in contact. You'd hear people screaming and you'd head in that direction with your bag, and that's what I was doing. I never fired my M16 in combat during the entire year. Other people did, but I never had to because I was always working on people that were wounded. Do you think that kind of helped you get through it, being so focused on your job? Well, yeah, because you, you, yeah, you had to concentrate on what you were doing because people's lives depended on it. And uh, a lot of times uh, people were severe enough that they would have to be medevaced out of there in the middle of the night, which we couldn't do until the, the fighting was over. Um, the majority, with maybe the exception of two times that I can remember offhand where, we're, where we were almost overrun, um, I would say the majority of encounters we had with the enemy never lasted more than four to five minutes. Yeah. They'd come, they'd hit, they'd throw grenades at you, they would use uh, uh, torpedoes, anything they could get their hands on that was explosive, and they would hit you as fast as they could, as quickly as they could, and then they would leave the area because they would run out of what explosives they had. As soon as they ran out, they left. We did have, um, I was on an LZ um, right on the border of Cambodia, and um, we were hit by approximately 2,500 North Vietnamese regulars at once. Uh, and, yes, and mine was about maybe 600. And I would say over half of them were almost inside the perimeter before we ever knew we were in contact. They were that good. And uh, we, lost, we lost close to 60 people. No, we lost, about, we lost about maybe 30 or 40 people that night. Um, those of us that lived were very lucky to get through the night. Um, if we had not called in air support, we would not have lived. Um, Huey helicopters and um, we had um, an airship, I can't remember what the name of it was, There's pictures of it that you took, but um, it had uh, two, um, two cannons on each side of it that fired 6,000 rounds per minute. And uh, that was what saved our butt that night. If it wasn't for him, I mean, there were bodies all over the place. They, um, in the wire, outside the wire, inside the perimeter. And we just told them, we said, we're inside a covered area. I said, the, the CO just yelled and so did the first sergeant. He said, he said, open fire, eliminate everything, shoot every square inch of the perimeter. Then all the rest of us got inside areas where we were protected. And uh, that was the only thing that saved us that night. It wasn't for those Hueys. We never would have gotten out of their line. Scary night. Do you know what part of Vietnam? Do you know where you were? Were you uh, in Two Corps mostly? Two Corps. Yeah, which is in the central part, and we were always near the Cambodian border, which of course our government said no, we weren't, and. <laughs> We spent a great deal of time on the um, on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which was in Cambodia, which they said we were not. And uh, you know, I, I, I never really understood. I'm sure it would have diplomacy attached to it as to why we weren't supposed to mention anything like that. But uh, that was '68, and this is now, and I really don't see how it makes a lot of difference. But um, it was um, it was interesting because we got to uh, we got to work with the Cambodian mountain yards, uh, the darker skinned people from from uh, that area of the country, and uh, 
And for whatever reason, and I'm not sure what reason it was, they were incredibly supportive of us, particularly coming in there and trying to help them and save their country. Um, I had two of them on different occasions, both, both nights, they saved my life. Um, and it was, um, it made you feel good to know that somebody on the side that you were supposed to be protecting actually gave a damn one way or the other. Because there were many instances when other people did not. And I don't think that you can blame them for feeling that way. They felt that way because, number one, the average life expectancy in Vietnam in that year was 25 years old. A 25-year-old man looked 75 to 80 in our terms. Most of them had all their teeth rotted out. They had no health, no medical, no anything as far as support to try and keep them alive. The, um, the statistics on jungle rot, ringworm, um, Things like uh, congenital VD were around 85%. Uh, the first two weeks I was there, I went into two camps with doctors to inspect people there to provide medical su support for them. And uh, it, was, it was just horrific. I mean, the, I, we did not see one child that didn't have cradle, cradle cap, ringworm, or jungle rot. Not one. Every single one of them born with it. Some of them born with congenital VD, just like their parents. Um, you know, when you don't have any medical support at all in your country, it's an absolute disaster. It's horrific. It's amazing that they've come to where they are now from where they were. Um, it's even more ludicrous when you consider how much money we have spent bringing him to that point after we were there trying to defend him to begin with and we're suffering the consequences and eventually we got pushed out of there. You know, it's, how, it's funny how things turn around. Um, so you, you, uh, you had stated that two, two of the local nationals had saved your life. Yes. Um, they, um, most of the time, the locals knew in advance when there was going to be an attack. They knew when it was going to happen, and they knew where it was going to happen. And one night, they said, you have to move from here as soon as it starts to get dark. They said, 4 a.m. tomorrow morning, you're going to get your ass kicked if you're still here. And they, uh, they got us out of there, and they moved us to a safer location. And sure as hell, 4 a.m. came and that area that we had been in got bombed and shelled like no tomorrow. And um, at another time, we were in a, in a jungle area and we were hit by some uh, North Vietnamese regulars. And um, two of these guys jumped out in front and went out and killed three or four of their people that were coming towards us to save us. Yeah, and um, you know, ever, ever, every time after that, we were always very, very protective of them because they had more or less joined us on our side and um, and stayed with us, uh, which I thought was pretty incredible, also, and not just for protection, but simply because uh, we were protecting their country, their land, their property their families, and they wanted to show their respect and appreciation, which I thought was pretty incredible. Um, as a combat medic, you had, you had uh, morphine? Yes. Oh, yeah. Did you experience any, you, you see or you hear of you know, drug addiction? Did you have any experience? Uh, I'll tell you, when... It, it didn't happen with us out in the field, but I'll tell you why. Because every single person, including myself, was responsible for pulling guard duty at night. And when you're out there on guard duty, you know, every once in a while, somebody would try and smoke a joint, do some drugs, this, that, or the other thing. 
was not at all uncommon to see that person dead the next day because a frag was thrown in their in their area where they were supposed to be protecting us. People were very, very sensitive to making sure that whoever was doing what they were supposed to do did it. And if you didn't, your life was in danger. You were putting everyone else's life in danger. Exactly. Um, so, during your tour in Vietnam, you spent how many months in Vietnam and how, many of, how much of that time was spent in, actually in the jungle? In the jungle? 85% of the time was in the jungle. We had one time when we went out, and we were out for 72 days, and uh, we were continually looking for B-52 bomb craters so that we could take a shower. We'd go jump in the B-52 bomb crater, wash our uniforms, take our uniforms off, put them on the side of the, of the thing, wash ourselves off, and by the time we were done, the uniforms were dry. Uh, but it was, uh, and I mean, you do things like, uh, you know, when we got uh, sorties, we'd come out and drop some food, you know, uh, sea packs and whatnot. Um, and we would take the, uh, the canned soda and whatnot and put them in B-52 bomb craters so they'd be colder, colder than, well, not cold, but they'd be a lot colder than if you left them out in the air. And, uh, you know, that was... Uh, that was our lifestyle for that period of time because the majority of the time, um, First Air Cavalry was not an operation that stayed in the rear, per se. We were always out in the field and, uh, and it was moving, never staying in the same place for any length of time. Um, and that was just our modus operandi and that's the way it went. And it was certainly a lot more, uh, taxing because I mean you'd be out in the middle of the jungle and walking through triple canopy jungle and all of a sudden you'd come into a herd of water buffalo <laughs> or you know uh, one time we walked we walked around we got through this triple canopy jungle and we came into an area that was more like a forest not so you know tightly compact and whatnot and we came around the corner from this rock and there was a big, huge Siberian tiger staring at us. <laughs> and we, we all just sort of froze in place. The tiger looked at us and figured he was outnumbered and he decided to move on. But, I mean, it was, uh, there was never a dull moment. We had, uh, you had that to contain, can, to contain yourself with. And then in, on top of that, you had all the mosquitoes and, uh, Humidity, 125 degrees every day. Um, uh, 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 a horde of uh, poisonous snakes all over the place. Pit vipers, black mamba, cobras, you name it. And um, there was never really any time that I can remember, except for the times when you would try to sleep, and I mean, we would try to sleep even if we were in water up to our, our up to our waist. You know, you try to you try to uh, get in a comfortable position on top of some weeds or something, and and try to take a nap for a while. But there was never any time really during my experience while I was there that you could let your guard down. You always had to keep one ear, and you know keep yourself alert enough so that if you had to move in a heartbeat, you could do it because you knew that's, you know, it could be the difference between life and death. Um, so you became very protective of, of yourself and your fellow soldiers out of absolute necessity. And, uh, there was no two ways about it. You had to do that. And it was imperative that, that was your priority, uh, which is why there was no, we had no problems with drugs or anything like that because it wasn't tolerated. Although I know of a lot of people in the rear that had, who were stationed in the rear, there were, there were a lot of problems like that, but there was a lot less day-to-day uh, -day danger facing them as opposed to where we were. 
you uh, during your time there, you suffered a lot of casualties due to different battles. Yes. Um, can you tell me a little bit how that impacted you and how it impacted the other ones, the other soldiers that were with you? Uh, I think I, I developed a tough skin early on because we had, I mean, you just didn't suffer casualties. I mean, you had people who were literally blown to pieces. Um, I mean, you had body bags that had two to three pounds of flesh in it. And um, if you let it get to you significantly, um, you couldn't do what you were there to do. So you really had to develop a tough skin and make sure that you focused. I think all of us, after a while, a very short while, focused primarily on getting from day one to day 365 and, and making sure that you were going to get home in one piece. Um, and fortunately, I can say that I did come back in one piece physically and mentally, and that I was exceptionally lucky because there were a lot of people who did not. During, uh, did you, during you, you say you were in the jungle for like 85% of the time. Yes. And you got a break from that environment. Where were you? Were you just in the rear? Did you get to go to the USO? No, no, no. We got, we, yeah, our USO was out in a, out in the jungle, <laughs> on a on a, uh, on a on a place that we had built, you know, and your your uh, actually, I got wounded three times, shrapnel and whatnot, during uh, and I was sent back to the rear to to uh, um, to go to a hospital. Um, I can't remember whether well, it was Tainan or where it was. But um, when they found out that I was a medic, after I'd been there for two days and I was starting to move around a little bit, they had me work third shift at the hospital. And, uh, and then the, two of the nurses said, you're going to be off tomorrow, right? And I said, yeah. They said, okay, well, don't go anywhere. Cause we're going to get you an outfit. They got me a first lieutenant's outfit. And I went to the officer's club with them and partied that night. It was the greatest night I have had in a long time, and it was tremendous. I really, really enjoyed it. But um, other than that, I mean, there wasn't, you know, we didn't go to U.S. So we did have one week's um, vacation it would, during which time I went to Bangkok. That was absolutely incredible. I did not have one American meal the entire time there. I ate all Thai food. All the stores, uh, you bartered for all the prices for everything you bought. And I got my mother something like uh, 15 yards of Thai silk for a dollar and a quarter a yard, which I'm sure has, you know, skyrocketed in price since then. And the town itself was... Um, was incredible. It was just very, very beautiful, just like the, the sea area next to it. Um, uh, many of the of the town buildings, all the churches, were covered in gold. It was just uh, it was like being in a fairyland, you know, something from a story you'd see in see in a movie. Uh, but um, other than that. I can honestly say that uh, there was nothing really, except for those two experiences, that would qualify as relaxing or taking your mind off things. You didn't have time to, and it wasn't it wasn't safe to. And it was that simple, and that's the way the whole tour of duty went, with the exception of those two experiences. You know, the one when I was wounded. The one where they went on R and R, um, the rest of it had to be the way it was for survival for everyone, and everyone had to adopt that same attitude simply because it was uh, 
It was too dangerous not to. There were too many obstacles that you had to worry about day to day. Um, not just the enemy, just you know your environment, the the heat, the humidity, jungle rot, ringworm. You couldn't wear you couldn't wear underwear or socks because they brought up your body within forty eight hours. Really? Yeah. So um, there were restrictions on you, on your lifestyle that just put you in a state of, not emergency, a state of continual scrutiny and security, personally and otherwise. I thought somebody was at the door, but I'm not, I don't know. Um, well, you, you said that you were wounded. Can you tell us about that? How did that happen? Um, it was um, a fragment bomb that came in. And uh, oh, I, I, I didn't get the worst of it because I was in between a couple of guys that I was working on, but I got it in my back and whatnot. And uh, they took me down to Lawn Bin and um, they used a magnet to pull out the shrapnel primarily. Um, but uh, like I said, the majority of the bombs or hand grenades or whatever, or like they made pipe bombs as well, um, that they used were not, I would not classify them as highly explosive or extremely dangerous type explosives. They improvised and built things from leftovers or things that they could get a hold of. Um, and yet they still won the war. You know, we eventually got our ass kicked out of there. So, after after being wounded and going off to for the convalescence and so on, um, did you go back to your original oh, yeah. the same guys? Or yes. You did? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Happy to see you back. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and I was happy to be back there because I, uh, I wasn't comfortable really being in a, in a back, back of the house environment, when you're, when you're used to a certain level of tension, you're better off, in the, I think, in the long run, because if you know you've got to go back to that, get back to it as soon as you can, because you, if you have a layoff and you, and you develop a, a laissez-faire attitude, it's going to affect your performance and affect the way you take care of people. Finished up in Vietnam. Your time was coming. You did, you did back to the states. Yes. Um, can you tell me about that? Um, well, I was excited, but I um, I really didn't have a clear picture of, of what was going to happen when I got back to the states. When I got back, I had thirty days off, so I, you know, back home, uh, and that was somewhat of a shock because. Um, we were not accepted with open arms when we came back from Vietnam. We were the child killers, the murderers, etc., etc. Uh, except for my mother was uh, assistant director of residence at Connecticut College at the time in New London, and um, except for some of the people there at that school that I had known beforehand and whatnot. Um, got a very, very cold reception, and it was very unnerving, um, whereas when I went back down to Fort Sam Houston in Kentucky, near, outside Louisville, um, it, it was great. It was really, really nice down there, and uh, I went to uh, NCO Academy when I got there, graduated second out of 150 or yeah, 150 people, I think, and became a staff sergeant and was in charge of headquarters, headquarters battery um, at Fort Knox. Um, and um, 
you know, we had the weekends off. You know, it was it was it was almost like having a regular life because you, uh, yeah, we got up at four thirty in the morning. But actually, that was the year when I was there that they eliminated um, rebel, rebelling. Yeah, that was the year they eliminated it, and um, it was it was it was the beginning of the easing of the military stigma in the service, and I think primarily because. I think they were beginning to see that if they didn't do something like that, that uh, the number of people that were going to enlist was going to plummet, and that they were afraid of that, so that they knew that they had to change something before that would occur. I, I can honestly say myself, I regret the fact that I didn't stay in, because if I had, I'd be, probably be in a lot better shape than I am now financially, although I, I'm not doing terribly. But I think in the long run, I probably would have been better off and I probably would have enjoyed it. Because I did enjoy it. I really did. Uh, even parts of Vietnam that I enjoyed. I enjoyed, uh, I enjoyed helping other people. I enjoyed helping people get through it. Uh, there were a lot of people that came very, very close to cracking mentally uh, in terms of their own stability. We had one guy, uh, Bob, huge guy. He was about 6'8", 400 pounds. And um, he could take an M60 machine gun, hold it up just like an AK-47. He picked, I remember watching him one day while we were out in the field. He picked off three of the enemy that were at least 100 yards away with just a short burst. And then didn't even, the gun didn't even rattle a little bit when he fired it. And then one night, we were in contact, and he was in one bunker, and I was in the bunker next to him. And you, you knew that we were going to get hit because you could, you could hear. We had, we had sensors outside the perimeter, mm -hmm. and you could hear that something was going on out there. So you knew there was something out there. And then we were pretty sure there wasn't water buffalo or anything like that. And uh, and he just lost it. He just freaked out. And I don't know why. To this day, I don't know why. Because we sent him back in a straitjacket. But it took six or seven of us to hold him down. He was throwing us around like paperweights. You know? um, and you wanted, you wanted to try and prevent things like that happening. Because that was the sort of situation where... If people have an experience like that, when they leave, like he left immediately, he was he was uh, sent back to the states. Um, that goes back with them, and a lot of them don't lose that. You know, it's there for life, and um, that's that's the sad thing. I I know of way too many people that came back that never came back whole. And um, I've always um, I've always felt that was a very sad thing because you know people didn't deserve to to lose continuity med mentally, you know, uh, to have something to you happen to you physically, that's you know par for the course because you're in a combat zone. And they can fix you, they can take you to the hospital, they can repair you, they can rebuild you. But when it's something that's metal and causes a tremendous amount of anguish, um, it's not always fixable. And I always felt frustrated by the fact that there wasn't a tremendous amount you could do for some of the people that really lost it. You had awfully strong bonds with those who you were alongside. Yes. Oh, yeah, you do. Uh, you, um, well, you counted on one another. You protected each other. You did your best to make sure that all of you were going to get back in one piece. And uh, I was fortunate. I was one of those ones who did. 
A lot of people didn't. Mentally or physically. Uh, and I, I'm sure that some of them have fought that for the better part of their lives. Have you, uh, do you still have contact with any of the people that you were... Uh, only, only one. He's out in California. And he, uh, he started his own business. He uh, runs a, um, a factory that, that um, cuts wood and makes it ready for lumber, for, to go to lumber yards to be sold. And uh, he lives down near San Diego with his wife and his family. And uh, they're doing well. We touch base every year. But um, he's the only one. The rest, um, it's like everybody came back. And a lot of people, when they came back, I think really wanted to forget. They just wanted to put it behind them and get it out of their mind. Um, and I always felt like... Um, it's there, and it's going to be there for my entire life. Um, and not necessarily in a negative way, because it wasn't necessarily in a negative way. But it's something, like everything else in life, you have to learn to deal with things. And once you learn to deal with them, and if you, if you contact somebody who's gone through something like that, it's a lot easier for you to help somebody like that if you're in, in control of yourself. If you're not, then you've got a problem. Uh, so, how was your, your final days in service? Finally finishing up your Fort Knox? Yes. And you, you ETS or, or Yes. Yes, yes, I ETS from, from Fort Knox. And uh, um, when I came home, I there was still that stigma attached, having, having been a Vietnam veteran, very much in place. Um, and um, I really, um, I, went <clears throat> I went to work down in New London at the Lighthouse Inn, and um, where I had worked prior to going in the service. And uh, I eventually ended up as the general manager there. Um, and like everything else that I'd gotten into, I pretty much threw, it, threw, threw myself into it 100%. And uh, I think that pretty much uh, saved my sanity and whatnot. It was, uh, I don't know, it wasn't... It wasn't what I had hoped to come home to. Let me put it that way. Um, and I don't hold it against anybody. I mean, if, if it were me and I was sitting on the other side and I looked at things, I would probably, in many cases, have had some of the same viewpoints that people did have at that time. And I understand that. But um, having been over there and gone through it, and seeing what was actually there, uh, particularly the fact that the, uh, the people were living in squalor, were, had, had absolutely, until we arrived, had absolutely no medical whatsoever. The average lifespan was 25 years old. Uh, they, uh, they lived off the rice fields and there was very, very little else that they did have, per se, until we arrived. And then, um, you know, even though we provided them with medical and whatnot, they still, you know, they still turned around and attacked us at night. <laughs> so, um, you know, it was, uh, it, was, uh, it was an experience, let me put it that way. And um, I made it through it, and... Uh, came back and managed to, to get through life, per se. Um, I always wonder if they had set something up for Vietnam returnees immediately upon them coming back 
I mean, yes, there were there were services that were available, but I never saw any direct, distinct, automatic thing where I think, for instance, that people that come back from a war zone should automatically go through uh, a two or three week breakdown session, you know, where people are interviewed, uh, questioned, just like just like you're answer, questioning me now, um, to find out where their mental stability is at, find out how their physical condition is, um, because I know I know four or five people right off the top of my head that came back and they were they were in a world of shit. They were in rough shape, physically, mentally, and uh, three out of the five didn't make it three years. Um, and to me, that shows us a, a lack of attention by our country in terms of, you know, all right, well, they've served, fine, good, they're done. You know, we just let them go. And um, I don't think that's a good idea. I think there needs to be follow through. Um, did you have the opportunity or did you have the GI Bill? Did you, did you use the GI Bill to go to school or did you, did you not go to school after the No, I didn't. No, I worked. <laughs> I worked. Yes. I worked, I got married, I had kids, and life goes on. Yeah. How did your military experience influence your, your thinking about war? Did it change it? Did it, did it? When I had my kids, I told them when they were old enough, I said, I want you to know one thing. I said, if you ever decide that there's a conflict and they bring back conscription and you're not comfortable with it, I'll drive you to Canada. Because um, the way the way Vietnam was treated after the war was atrocious. It was horrific. And um, and completely unnecessary and unjustified. The people that were there, 90% of them were conscription and uh, had no choice in the matter. They were told they had to go, they went, and fortunately some of them made it out okay. A lot of them didn't. And the ones that suffered, I think, the most were the ones that came back mentally disabled. And there were a lot. How did your service experiences affect your life? Did it have a long-term effect, or? I think it had a beneficial effect. It made me, it made me a lot more responsible. It made me think about just about everything I did uh, in the long run. Um, I, I no longer had that general laissez-faire, you know do what you want to do, go out, drink with the boys, this, that, or the other thing. I thought about things before I did them and um, realized that there were consequences for my actions. And uh, a lot of people in my age category at that time, you know, just, you know, helter skelter, let's go out and party, and that's the way it was. And I, I never really fit into that group. And... Um, I don't regret that because I think that was a positive. Um, I, I'm grateful for the fact that um, that Vietnam did not affect me or destroy any mental capabilities of survival or, or getting through life per se. Um, I um, I felt more confident when I came back than I did when I went over. And I think that was because 
of what I did while I was over there, how I handled the stress, the tension, the bullets, the bodies, everything, um, while I was there. And I think I was very, very fortunate to have come back in as, in as good a shape as I did, mentally, physically. Eh. <laughs> well, Ted, is there is there anything you'd like to add that we've not covered in this interview? Mm. Only that um, in the event in the future, should it uh, happen that you need anyone to talk to anyone or groups or anything like that, I'd be more than happy to. Perfect. Well, I want to want to thank you for your service and thank you for giving us the opportunity to document a little, little bit of your uh, military history. I appreciate it.